Okay, welcome back, everyone. So good to have you back in this uh, session. We were talking about reasons why our prayers are not answered, and there were a whole bunch of uh, comments. People said that we don't pray the right prayer, we don't pray in the right way, um, then it's not God's time. Or uh, someone else was mentioning that uh, maybe we we haven't done something right so these are all the views opinions that we've got so far but we'll see what does the bible say so we can have an opinion but what is it that the word of god uh, is telling us is the important question to ask here in the chat um daniel says because of our faith we pray but we don't have faith that our prayers will not be answered okay the lack of faith is also another reason why we don't get the answers. So there are a few reasons that are listed in our notes. The first one is asking amiss or asking with the wrong motives. That's a reason why we may not receive what we are asking for. For example, if I am seeking a position of authority, there can be many reasons why. I could seek that position so that I can have a greater influence, that I can do more good, uh, be a blessing to the people. These are all the positive reasons why somebody seeks a position of authority. Now, the negative reasons would be to um, simply gain power or to get an ego boost, like you feel great that I am the person in charge, I'm great. So. Uh, these are all the wrong reasons or we um, don't want to treat people well. You know, we just want to uh, be the boss over everyone. These all would be the wrong reasons. So now when we pray and we say, God, I want that. I want that. I want that position. What's happening? The motives are not right. And that's what James uh, talks about in uh, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He says, look, you ask. But you're not asking for the right reasons. How can God even answer your prayers? So when we ask with the wrong motives, then we won't get it. But when we pray with the right motives or we pray in line with what God's word says, he always hears us, is what the Bible says. Okay? Somebody uh, had mentioned that um, maybe God doesn't hear. So only in the case of uh, demonic hindrance, one passage, we read that God didn't hear or the prayer didn't go forth to God. Uh, but in all other places, God hears us. If we are praying aligned to the will of God, always remember, God will hear. There's nothing stopping our prayer from reaching God. So uh, this is a really beautiful passage, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Uh, I would request... Uh, a person to please read it. Maybe uh, Brother Komal, could you please read? 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God mm. that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Mm. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Mm. Yes, thank you. So as we can see here, um, there we can have confidence that whenever we pray, right, we ask anything according to his will. What does he do? He hears us. So we have this confidence that this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So it 
is very simply put that whenever I pray, align to the word of God, align to the will of God, God is hearing my prayer. I must never think that, hey, maybe God didn't hear my prayer. What happened? You know, where did my prayer escape? Where did it fly away? God didn't hear it. No, what does the scripture says? Say, it says, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, remember this always, that this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So when I pray aligned to the will of God, certainly God will hear me. I don't have to have the smallest doubt. Okay, It's only when I am, or the opposite is also <coughs> true. So uh, the opposite would be that we will have no confidence if we are praying misaligned to the will of God. If you are praying something outside the will of God, how can God answer that prayer? He won't hear us. But if you are praying in the will of God for our lives, when we pray valid prayers, sometimes we call them valid prayers, because in the scriptures, there are um, you know verses that tell us that these promises are available. God's guidance. Yes, can I ask God every day, Lord, please lead me, show me the way, um, strengthen me, um, you know, give me a vision, give me a dream for my life. Very valid because it is there in the Bible. The same God who spoke to Abraham, the same God who led Abraham will do it for us, each one of us today. So God's guidance or you want to ask for uh, wisdom, understanding, all these things are granted in the word of God. So we can ask. And God always hears us because we can go back to the scripture, 1 John 5 verse 14. Yes, in this we have confidence that if we ask anything in the will of God, he hears us. right? But if we don't ask in the will of God, that's where the problem happens. And we wonder, why is God not answering? Why is he not making this happen? It's just not happening. Maybe it's not aligned to God's word. That is the reason why we are not getting answers to our prayers or our motives are not correct. Those kind of prayers God will not answer. It's already written in God's word. Now, let's see what are some of the other reasons using the wrong kind of prayer. Wrong kind of prayer, uh, we will you know, look at um, the different kinds of prayer later on. But then, you see, we must be would need to use the right kind of prayer. There are some times that a prayer of thanksgiving will be the most powerful prayer. For example, in, um, what was that passage? John 11, what did Jesus say? Father, I thank you that you always hear me. He didn't start off with, I command you, Lazarus, come out of the grave. But there was an appropriate prayer he prayed in that moment. He said, Father, thank you that you always hear me. So there are different kinds of prayers, thanksgiving, petitioning God, um, you know, praying in the spirit. So there are all these types of prayers that we can pray through, knowing which kind of prayer to pray in a given moment, in a given situation is something that we need to grow into. So maybe we are not praying the right kind of prayer. Uh, so that is also a reason why we may not have an answer. Uh, the next reason, as um, uh, you know, Cyril pointed out, the timings of God. The Sunday our sermon was about God's timing, right? So God has a timing. We may, um, because of our desire, we may press in to God and say, no, God, you got to do it right now. But we must align our hearts to God's calendar. God may have another time in another season where he would grant that need. Um, so we must trust God and journey with God till that time to see the fulfillment of God's promise. Sometimes what happens, the promise is true, but waiting for that faithfully uh, can be quite challenging. That's when people give up and they say, God never answered my prayer. Okay, uh, But that's not true. Maybe we just didn't wait for God's time. 
usually um, in the ministry, when we start off doing the ministry, uh, I've heard uh, some pastors share this. They start a church, but the initial years are so challenging because they have to do everything. You know, they have to preach, they have to organize, they have to go invite the people, they have to visit the people. Um, people have needs, they have to minister to the needs of the people. So growing a church, not so easy at all. And I'm sure you know many of us know that. But you think about this, it's because many of these ministers of God, men and women of God, they have journeyed with God patiently, uh, persevered with commitment, they never gave up that, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a decade, two decades to see the kind of growth that we may look at it now and say, wow, look at that, you know, look at that congregation, it's thriving, this is happening, that is happening. But it's because of people who didn't give up. They journeyed with God for years, decades, before some of these promises have materialized. This is the reality. So there is a timing, God's timing. Sometimes we just want it tomorrow. Right? We are the um, microwave generation. They call us the microwave generation. Now, one second, one, not even one minute. It's too late. It's taking one minute to heat my food. What a waste of time. Make it faster, make it faster. Everything one click. Right? We want to shop one click. Um, everything. A degree also we want one click maybe, I don't know, but it's not possible. We have to put in the hard work. So this microwave thing doesn't work with God. We have to be patient. We have to trust God. God's timing is when um, certain prayers will, uh, we'll see the fulfillment of those prayers. So if we give up in the middle and we say that God didn't answer my prayer, that is not correct. Because God wants to answer. We are the ones who um, we stepped out of God's purpose and God's plan. So that is the reason, another reason why we don't see answers. Now, uh, we have a few more listed here. Hindrances in our own lives, as uh, someone stated, uh, pride, uh, somebody mentioned it, unbelief, yes, that also stops God from um, God's answers from coming into our lives. There can also be disobedience. For example, uh, Saul in the Bible, right? Saul, um, we know that God selected him as the king. But he was full of rebellion. God wanted him to do certain things. He was doing his own, um, you know, activities. And God did not like it. What did he tell him finally? He said, look, obedience is better than sacrifice. I want obedience from you. I don't want all these great, um, you know, show of uh, achievements and your sacrifices. I don't want all that. Simple obedience. That's what I want. So when we walk in disobedience to God and we say, but God, you said in your word, you give me. You give me. How can God answer us? Because we are not walking in obedience. Right? These are all the issues that happen uh, when we, you know, don't understand what God's word is saying to us. So obedience in our lives is very important before the Lord. So the way our heart is before the Lord, the way our character is before God, all these things matter a lot. And we need to develop ourselves. Maybe, you know, we are not... Uh, we, we see uh, some of these weaknesses. It's time to say, God, I repent. I, would, I want to change. I want to grow. Uh, and I want to become that obedient believer or child of God to um, see victory in my life in every way, even in the area of prayer. Okay? So disobedience is a, is a problem. Sin is a problem. Sometimes believers, so unfortunate, we know that scriptures tell us that the Lord Jesus has set us free. Uh, right, we are no longer slaves of sin because of the of what Jesus did on the cross. He broke the power of sin over our lives. Romans, you know, the study of the book of Romans, it teaches us: if I am a believer, Jesus set me free from being a slave to sin. Otherwise, what does sin do to people? It makes a slave of the people. That people can't come out. They are in bondage. They are in chains. But what does scriptures? Uh, what do, does the scripture tell us? Jesus set us free. If I'm a believer, sin has no dominion over my life. Meaning, I can conquer. I can live the life that God is calling me to live for him. I can't make excuses that uh, uh, this person is making me do this or, you know, uh, uh, I, I couldn't get out of um, some of the problems of yesterday. Those, those things are haunting me. 
if you look at what the Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you. That's what the Bible says. We are no longer under, uh, we are no longer under the devil. But now we come under the power of the cross. So we are overcomers, right? So walking in sin is not an option for a believer. Okay, there is no excuse to walk in sin. But unfortunately, some of us, you know, we may continue. We know some things are wrong, but we never give up. We just keep doing the same thing again and again. A lifestyle like that will not bring answers. Okay, so that is also a, a reason why we may not receive answers uh, from God. Then, um, a wrong understanding of prayer. So, as I shared earlier, without faith, we pray and we just hope that there will be some response from God. That is not praying in faith. Because when we pray, we expect God will do something. When I pray, it has to. Because that is the right pattern or design of prayer. If I pray, God hears me, he will respond. But when we pray thinking, not sure, it may hit the target, it may not hit the target, right? That's not right. So there's no faith there. Then how do we expect an answer to what God is wanting to do? Uh, so these are all things for us to think about. I'll look at the chat here. Um, okay, Esther. Okay, Esther is, uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Esther, for correcting me. Um, yeah, so I, I stated earlier that the prayer did not reach God. I am wrong. My, I apologize. Uh, so she posted, she posted the um, scriptures here. So the prayer was heard the first day. The answer was delayed. So that is the hindrance. Okay, bless you. Uh, I correct myself. So the prayer was heard, but the answer was delayed. So that that was the delay that came into that situation. So thank you, Esther. I appreciate that. Okay, now moving on. Um, Sanjay, Sanjay is uh, sharing a passage. Uh, he says, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So Psalm 141 verse 2. Okay, and uh, the rest of the passage there, where you know the psalmist um, is expressing his his desire um, for prayer, and you know he talks about his prayer. Thank you, uh, Sanjay, for sharing that. Uh, did Did you have a question associated with that, or some specific insight? No. Okay. Fine. Uh, then we'll go forward. Right, we've looked at some of the reasons why we don't receive answers from God, but that should not be the case. We should always receive answers from God if we are, um, if we are in line with what God's word is saying. Okay, uh, we've settled that. Now, let's talk about boundaries. Boundaries in prayer. We said that the way prayer is designed it should always work. It should always be effective and successful. However, there are some boundaries to keep in mind. One being, with prayer, we cannot manipulate people's will or control them or force them. So this means uh, if you take a um, situation where, uh, let's imagine, um, Mm, a friend, okay. Uh, we just this is an imaginary uh, situation, and that I'm telling you about. So there are two friends. Uh, let's let's think that you know one friend um, he's in need, and the other friend <coughs> seems to be doing very well. So the friend who's in need wants um, maybe you know uh, some money or um, okay. Let let's imagine some money from the uh, so-called the friend who is doing well. Now, can this friend in need pray, God, make him give me help, or you know, make him help me, make him do this, make him, um, uh, you know, respond to me, make him. These prayers are outside of the boundary of prayer. Why? Why? Why do you think it's outside the boundary? 
if we pray to for god to um sort of uh, impose something on a person's will and make them do it is that a correct way of praying or not okay uh all right so uh, brother sanjay says no um if you don't mind could you elaborate why you're saying no okay All right, so a couple of comments that are coming in here. Fine. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll just uh, share the answer. Okay, so Sanjay said no for uh, some other reason. Uh, okay, the answer to the question that I asked, you know, can we pray a prayer which says God force somebody to do something for us? It won't work. because what we are doing is we are praying against um the will of that person god has given all of us a will and he never forces us so will is the ability to make choices the way god created adam and eve in the garden of eden and he gave them choices now we may ask the question god already knew that uh, e adam and eve would sin so why didn't he stop them why didn't he tell them beforehand you know um be careful the serpent will come to you and uh, please don't do this he never tried to manipulate he told them what needed to be done but then it was their choice from the beginning god gives man and woman choice you do what you want to do so when we pray a prayer which tries to override the will of someone and we want to make them you know help us make them like us make them do this those prayers are not the way god has created us everyone has free choice so we cannot try to manipulate people's will to make them do things that we want them to do so such prayers are not uh, uh, biblical prayers again uh, we can't pray prayers that contradict god's word or the overall plan of god for mankind we've already discussed this so these are things to keep in mind we can't use prayer going back to the first point to um force people you know sometimes we i i don't know if uh, uh, you know it's happened to you but i have thought about this why can't we we make let's say a a child has gone far away from god and the parents are praying for that child they are praying and they can also pray that you know god minister to my son um and uh, speak to him send godly people into his life uh, and let him have encounters these are all valid prayers but if they pray something like make him he has to choose this college and he has to she has to or husbands and wives you know they pray they have to she has to he has to that's not correct because god gives everyone free will okay we can't override free will even through prayer because when we try to override people's free will um in the bible it actually refers to um witchcraft because that's what people who do witchcraft uh, are all about what do they do whatever they want they they want to make people do those things but that's against god god doesn't work like that god gives a free will right so manipulating using prayer is it doesn't work and we should never do that okay there is a boundary though we are saying prayer is meant to be um successful effective the boundary is we cannot override human choice free will we can influence we can try to be a very positive influence so that they can choose the right options but we cannot make people uh, do things even salvation think about this the lord jesus died on the cross right 2000 years ago today we are preaching the gospel and whosoever shall believe it's a choice this is what jesus did we have to make the choice to say okay jesus forgive my sins 
come into my life, make me a new person. Uh, so this is how even prayer works. Uh, God allows us to have our free will. Uh, now, let me just go back to our comments here. Daniel says, the point you are discussing is the answer of one of my questions, okay, which was not which I was not getting for past many years. Praise God. We are glad to hear that, Daniel. Um, and bless you. OK, so he gave us an answer for the example that I share. Angeline says, it's um, selfish prayers not aligned to God's character. Instead, we should ask God to provide for us. OK, all right. And uh, uh, Brother Eric, he says, they are intentional prayers. And God does not, is not a respecter of people. And Daniel also says, because we are not praying, but rather we are using prayer for our own need. Yeah, again, we are asking Amis. So these are all um, things for us to note. I also want us to consider this section in our notes, which talks about Paul's prayer. Because we said that prayer is meant to be, OK, so um, Blessy is asking uh, some scriptures. OK, regarding which one, which point, uh, Blessy, the, um, we, can't, we can't override people's will for that. OK, we can't override people's will. So the example that I gave you about Adam and Eve, you know, that's, that's in itself um, a scriptural example, because God gave man free will. Um, and also regarding salvation, because God doesn't force anyone. We can't force people to have faith in Jesus Christ. So that also shows us that even though God can if he wants to, he's giving all of us free will. Um, but are you convinced with these two examples? Thank you. Okay, so specific scripture. Okay, I can't think of like a verse maybe, but one point that comes to my mind is at the time uh, in the book of Acts, when a lot of persecution came, even at that time, you find that the believers were praying to God. They could have prayed and said, you know, God, you make these rulers change their mind. You make them, you make them. But the prayers were not like that. The prayers were not to manipulate um, their will, but it was more for, uh, you know, protection. It was more for the believers to thrive. Uh, it was more for, you know, the, the kingdom, the church to grow powerfully. So we don't find even believers, like the early church believers, praying such prayers. And God always gives us that option. Okay, so I'm not able to tell you one verse. Uh, let me see if I find something later. I, I'll tell you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, yes, sister. Hello, sister. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, say now in Manipur, all this situation is taking place. And there's such so many inhuman things happening over there. Now, uh, yes. can't we pray for uh, the authorities against their behavior towards those people? Yes, of course we can pray. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying influence, right? Influence yeah. is possible. So when we pray, what happens? It's a spiritual influence. We are saying, God, you know, you do this. You appoint the right people. Give them the wisdom. Give them the understanding. Help them to walk in the fear of God. Uh, you know, let the policies be regulated. Let the people be protected. We can pray prayers like that. The point I'm making is we we cannot we cannot impose or force, you know, our will on another person using prayer. That's the difference. 
I mean, the leaders, the the leaders we have elected, they are the ones who are doing this to the people, which is, uh, I mean, we have given them authority to rule the people, and this is injustice which is done. So, if we pray against the leaders, is it wrong? See, pray against the leaders. Um, I wouldn't say that, uh, sister, because if you look at uh, other passages of scripture. Um, like First Timothy chapter two verse one, uh, we are encouraged to pray for the pray for those who are in authority. So instead of uh, praying in a condemning way, yeah, the things they are doing um, uh, may not be right, but still, scriptures are encouraging us to pray, to bless, to pray to um, you know uh, for God to intervene. Right in those circumstances, not like against those people. Uh, does it? Uh, I mean, are you are you agreeing with that? Or I am not sure because uh, I myself I'm not convinced because uh, no. the thing is I feel we have voted them and they promised to uh, take care of the people and to treat everybody equally. And uh, what has happened is is so much. Uh, against uh, you know it is not uh, because they are this because they are christians and i don't know what is exact reason but mm -hmm. they are not kept to their word what they promised to mm -hmm. do and in spite of doing so much harm they are not even trying to help them this mm -hmm. is what i mean uh, what they are doing is wrong but is it wrong for us to pray that uh, you know that they will take uh, action and they will change their behavior and to change what they're doing is it wrong to pray in that way is it wrong to pray that they will change their attitude yes behavior and you know to help these people yeah so that we can pray because that would come under the category of influence okay there is a scripture in the book of Proverbs also. I'm just not able to remember the number, but it says that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord and he turns it whichever way he wants. So that that is a prayer which says, God, you have control over the hearts of these people. So we are praying to God to change their hearts. What I am saying is I'm saying to, um, you know, uh, pray condemning prayers over leaders is not scriptural yes they are not correct that i agree with you they are not correct but still the prayers that we pray would be more of influencing them okay by which i mean um, lord give them good understanding uh, or uh, you know lord uh, give them the wisdom uh, fill them with the fear of the lord in this manner we can pray instead of saying uh, you know um, this person is wrong and uh, I want him out uh, because I don't see any such, uh, you know, passages here. Even coming here to Acts chapter 4. So I'm here in Acts chapter 4. Okay. Yeah. So Acts chapter 4, uh, the last section. One second, let me look at it. Uh, one second, I just have to change, okay? Huh? I'm just changing, okay? Yeah, uh, so when you come here, uh, it, this is also a prayer system. Maybe you can go through it a little later. You can read from verse 23 to verse 31 when the rulers are not being right. They are not being fair. Uh, Peter and John are arrested um, and many things happen. So you can just notice the way they pray because they are also praying at a time when the rulers are, um, uh, you know, not walking in justice. So that should give us an idea about how is it that we can pray, you know, when, when things are not uh, going right. Uh, yes, Esther. Uh, sister, to add on to what you just said uh, yes. to Jet Gertrude's uh, question, yes. uh, we are uh, we, God has given us the authority uh, to pray and condemn the things which are wrong. However, 
uh, we are not allowed to uh, dominate or make a decision for somebody else like pray that, uh, that is what you are trying to say so yes. what <laughs> so, yeah. so what i feel here is that whenever uh, we are praying uh, god has given us complete authority and it is not the rulers or the people or the flesh and blood our warfare is against the powers of darkness mm. against the so it's not the person or the garment but it is the uh, we should condemn the acts exactly and the, the, the condemn the uh, intentions of them but at the same time it is not the people whom we should hate or uh, build a strife in our hearts it is the uh, evil which is within them who is uh, using them as a you know puppet and making them do all this so mm -hmm. sure. acts should be condemned we should pray for people in authority what is wrong is wrong uh, however not the it's not no hatred towards them yes yeah thank you esther i think you put it uh, you know quite clearly there um, and uh, quite un you know we were able to understand it so that's the point that i'm also making um uh, and uh, just want to add to that uh, what esther said is we are not here against human beings against people but our battle is against uh, not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers right uh, and spirits of wickedness in the heavenly places so uh, ephesians 6:12 tells us that we are here to battle against demonic powers not to battle against uh, people and thanks sam i see the scripture there uh, uh, sam has posted uh, proverbs 21:1 that's the scripture that i quoted about the heart of the king which is in the hand of the lord so just going back to the comments there are some more comments Yeah, so Lucy is asking then, how do we pray for salvation of people? Is it okay to pray, Lord, let your salvation salvation flow into their lives? Yes, that is correct, Lucy. You can pray like that. About praying for people's salvation, we'll come back to it. There's an entire chapter uh, about it. And uh, Sanjay adds, pray against the sin, not against the sinner. Our battle is not against flesh, but principalities and powers in high places. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's really nice to uh, hear your thoughts. Now, let me go to the last section in our uh, chapter here. Since we were talking about success in prayer and, you know, 100% uh, effectiveness of prayer, in the life of Jesus, we know that he was, you know, always successful. But there is one incident or one um, uh, passage about the life of Apostle Paul that may confuse us because there is a time when you know paul prays um, regarding uh, regarding a problem that he's going through but god tells him my grace is sufficient for you right uh, and based on this we as believers we sometimes uh, excuse our um, we may not have received an answer to our prayer but we excuse ourselves saying Oh, God is just saying, okay, keep going through this issue because my grace is sufficient for you. But let's understand that passage really well. That's what I want us to do now. Can someone turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 through 10? It's kind of a little long passage. Um, so who would like to bless you? Can you read it, please? 2 Corinthians 12, 6 to 11. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, but we have been truly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because uh, just I... one moment uh, blessing please hold on uh... Uh, is, is that second corinthians or are you it is 
ஒருவர் <laughs> concerning this thing i pleaded with the lord three times that i might depart from me and he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made for perfect in weakness therefore most gladly glad, gladly i will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of christ may be rest upon me therefore i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in needs in persecutions in distress for Christ's sake for when I am weak then I am strong okay thank you uh, thank you blessy so here in this passage we find that Paul prayed to God to take away um, a thorn in the flesh okay what is that thorn in the flesh there is an explanation uh, in verse 7 it says a messenger of Satan to buffet me meaning thorn in the flesh was a demon okay okay let's move on uh, and then when he prayed to get rid of this demon god told him my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness so though paul prayed he didn't get the answer that he wanted god said my grace is sufficient for you and what was the thorn in the flesh it was not another human being it was not a sickness okay these days uh, when we don't understand this passage uh, there is that tendency to attribute that uh, thorn in the flesh as a person we, people have said things like you know oh my boss is a thorn in the flesh or you know this person is a thorn in my flesh that's incorrect because Paul was not referring to a human being he was referring to a demon and what else do we notice here uh, when he prayed for us uh, for god to um, get rid of this demon how uh, how many how many times thrice thrice what did god tell him my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness but let's also understand why this happened okay let's look at verse 7 it says lest i should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations so there is the answer why did god not take away that demon to humble paul why humble paul because paul is saying the abundance of revelation so for us today to say i have a thorn in the flesh and god is not going to answer my prayer uh, god is only saying my grace is sufficient for you god will not answer he will not take away uh, you know uh, he will not deliver me or he won't heal me um, because god is saying my grace is sufficient for you will not be the right application because it was only apostle paul who had abundance of revelation which is why god wanted to keep him humble understood now can any one of us compare with paul's revelation i don't think so he wrote most of the new testament that kind of revelation god gave paul so um scriptures you know tell us that for paul to be humble and lest i should be exalted above measure he says that i should not become proud this was a very specific situation to paul so none of us can take this passage and state that i have a thorn in the flesh or god is not going to answer my prayer and god is saying my grace is sufficient for you will be incorrect simply because this is a unique situation it is applicable only to apostle paul because of his abundant revelations which none of us can compare with even the apostles at the time of uh, uh, paul they were different their grace their gifting was different but Paul had abundance of revelations and for that sake you know, God um, 
God, he's a God who, uh, whatever is meant for evil, he turns it around for our good. So in this case, a demon was troubling Paul, but God used that situation to help him be humble. Okay. Uh, so this is a clarification which we thought that you know we can talk about at this point. Uh, any thoughts, any comments? Okay, wonderful. Thank you for acknowledging. Sure. So in that case, if we don't have any further questions, um, we can pre and close so that in the next class, I can just begin with a new topic and continue from there. Uh, I'll leave this opportunity open for uh, maybe someone from online. Could you please pray as we close today's session? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and pray. Yeah, yes, Sam, please. Thank you. Okay, um, Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for this class. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that we have learned. Um, thank you, Lord, for all the revelation, and uh, I just thank you, Lord, for the truth that has been imbibed in our hearts. I pray that it would take deep root. Um, I pray, Lord, that as we learned about prayer, that we would look to Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith and we would follow him lord in our prayer life just as jesus prayed i pray lord that our hearts would desire lord to long after you lord and you would take us to newer levels uh, from where we were in our prayer life and i pray lord that all the doubts that were asked and the doubts in our minds would be cleared by the revelation of your holy spirit lord so we just submit our lives to you and uh, we just thank you once again for this time and this opportunity in jesus mighty name we pray Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of these sessions. Uh, please continue to go over your notes um, as often as possible, and we'll come back again to discuss about prayer and intercession in the next class. Okay. Thank you, and bye for now. God bless you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Pankaj. Bye. God bless.